bands of the 80s. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about. I want to talk a little bit about Ireland uh, and Northern Ireland. Uh, in my experiences, well, not so much my experiences there, like what I was doing there. What, looking back now, um, you know, so like in high school, after all that sort of turbulence in my life and trauma, okay, I found myself becoming noticed more and more because because of those things, you know, and, and part of the, the violence was my defense system kicking in, um, and, and part of it was just kind of confusing. And all the people around me didn't really have those experiences, you know, like all my friends didn't have those experiences. So it was like, you're becoming a celebrity for these things. <laughs> like you're becoming, you're, they're giving you attention for these things. And you're like, well, I get, I'm supposed to follow that path or something like that. But anyway, like it did make a lot of sense to me. And so, and like I said, I was dumping a lot of that into art and sports. I went to college at Purchase College my first year. A good friend of mine, John Young, who was into filmmaking as I was, was had attended there, and he brought me down there. And it was a small campus, but it had a pretty strong film program. And he had graduated from it, and he knew all the professors, and he brought me down there, and we, we talked it over. Uh, with our, you know, I met all them, and, and they liked me, and. I got accepted to the program, you know, and it was pretty competitive. It was like 15 students out of, you know, 600 to 1,000 maybe, I don't know. Um, so it was pretty competitive to get accepted to, into that program. And uh, I went to purchase college for my first year after uh, high school. And I just kind of found more of the same, you know, more people didn't have those experiences and it wasn't really helping me progress uh, like as a person you know like I still couldn't figure out how to go about things in relationships and like our the Irish were very big right then because of you two and also the troubles in Northern Ireland were, were pretty intense at that time there was a big shooting in a cemetery and some of the bombings some big bombings in Enniskillen and, um, and my grandmother, uh, my father's side, had always reinforced the Irishness in me. And she had given me some books. Uh, our family name was Doherty, or Doherty, if you want to say it in American, not in Gaelic. <laughs> it's Doherty in, in Gaelic. And uh, she gave me some books, and, and the name Doherty has been, it was a, you know, prominent in these books about the troubles. So I thought, oh, that's, these are people who know what I'm going through, you know, like this is what I, these people won't treat me like a celebrity, you know, <laughs> and they won't, like, give me that attention that I just think is kind of weird, you know, like they don't, we have something in common, you know, and uh, so I left to purchase college, and then I went to Syracuse University for a semester, mostly to be around Sheila because I really botched that up, you know, I really messed, I didn't know what to do, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, and I really kind of humiliated her, and I, and I regret all that, but it's who I was, you know, there's nothing I could do about it, I didn't have any guidance, you know, I didn't have anything to grab onto, except uh, feelings, you know, and, uh, to Syracuse University and once again you know I just kind of felt isolated but there was a big Irish community in Syracuse I started to learn the language Gaelic and I started to hang out with that Irish community more and more and, uh, through them I, I found uh, a gentleman named Dennis Mulcahy uh, who was a New York City police officer and he had run a program called Project Children which brought children from Protestant backgrounds in Northern Ireland, children from Northern Ireland with Protestant backgrounds and those with Catholic backgrounds and brought them to the United States for you know, summers and had them housed together and kind of um, lived together in hopes of kind of dispersing some of the tensions and, you know. I thought
thought that was a great idea, you know, I thought that was a good thing, and, and I felt, and I thought, you know, what I need to, and so I thought, I'm going to go to Northern Ireland, I'm going to write a book, you know, I had this book of mine called Belfast USA, basically, it was kind of, and it was kind of going to be my Ulysses, you know, uh, me kind of searching for answers in this climate, you know, and just kind of with that as a background. And, uh, and so, uh, so I talked to, you know, and I talked to Dennis Mulcahy, basically, I sent them a letter, and uh, they said, you know, we can help you out with that, we would like to help you out with that, we can, there's people we can put you in contact with, and if you like, you can also stay with them uh, in their homes. And I thought, well, you know, yeah, that's a really generous officer, I really appreciate that, and I'm going to accept it, you know, and see, see if I can write this book that I have uh, in mind. You know, it wasn't going to be like a documentary in the sense of, you know, this Ulysses was a documentary. It wasn't supposed to be anything like that. James Joyce's Ulysses. It was supposed to be something like that. A stream of consciousness, kind of unconventional documentary, I guess you could say, or fiction, or non-fiction. And uh, so off I went to Northern Ireland, you know, without having been there before to meet these people. I'm not going to get into great detail about my experiences there. I don't know if it's if it's wise to, <laughs> just because some of the people, but some of the people I met were great. You know, I remember in Newry, uh, walking along the mountains, and hearing about Cuculian, the uh, Irish hero, uh, hearing those folk tales and the old cairns, uh, the stone and like the little mini stone hinges scattered across the landscape. Um, I remember different times in Belfast going. Meeting young people, I remember you know the separations between the streets. The Protestant streets are very clear. There are walls and checkpoints and things like that. You know, I had to go through. Um, and so I went to Northern Ireland and I spent a lot of time with the families. But I didn't really know what I was doing. You know, I didn't really know what I was going after with this book. It was a stream of conscious thing. So I was just kind of absorbing there. And I don't think really a lot of the people felt like. I knew what I was doing, <laughs> you know, I was just trying, it wasn't a direct sort of, let me sit you down and talk to you about, I did a little of that, but I, mostly it was kind of like to try and, like I said, it was Belfast, USA, so it was about me trying to understand my own development, you know, and uh, so we got to a point where I, I you know, kind of decided, I, and talking over with one of the families I was living with that, to find a place of my own. And uh, I did that in Belfast, a really pretty nice place up by the Botanic Gardens and Gardens there. Uh, it was kind of interesting because my neighbor was a Japanese woman and uh, she would make me little cards and gifts periodically and knock on my door uh, because uh, she heard me kind of singing in my room, I guess. I was big into singing YouTube songs. And uh, so she would come over and knock on my door and bring me these gifts. And that was pretty cool. Uh, I remember up in Colerain, one, probably one of the best times I ever had in Ireland. There was this kind of very private club where for like a pound you could get to this big bowl of Irish stew and, and a Guinness. That was a great time. It was a, a keel, you know, one of the Irish, traditional kind of Irish keel. Pretty, that was a, that was a great time. I remember going across the uh, you know the cliffs of Mar and uh, beautiful places up in the north. You know, the, one of the things I really kind of walked away with was that the north was a very underappreciated countryside. It's 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 extremely beautiful up in the north of Ireland, and uh, you know because of the troubles, a lot of people would kind of veer and stay away from it. But it's an amazing landscape. So anyway, I stayed like in Northern Ireland for about two more months writing, you know, all kinds of different stuff. I still have a lot of those papers, you know, and sometimes I look back through them and see what was going on. And, uh, and then I got to the point where I was like, all right, I'm going to leave, I guess, but I want to drive, yeah, I'm going to get a car. I'm going to live in my car for a week or was it two weeks? It was either a week or two weeks, you know, I'm going to rent a car 
I just got to live out of my car for two weeks and just drive around the countryside. <laughs> so I got the car and I figured I'm just going to follow the coast, you know. And I got, I headed out and like I did it in like three days, you know, <laughs> the, entire, the entire coastline, uh, sleeping in my car. I remember like weird things like waking up on the beach with a cow, <laughs> like a dead cow had washed up and, and stuff like that. But uh, I did it in three days, right? So I just kept on driving, and I just would drive back and forth. And I started to investigate the inner, uh, the countryside of Ireland, the inland. I remember one time I got stuck, you know, I just kept following these dirt roads, and I ended up in a cow field. Just, I got stuck in a pile of the dirt. It was kind of funny because I was staying in a hotel. There's like really cheap, like I think it was on Donegal, but uh, and there, you know, hotels are pretty expensive, inexpensive. Then I stayed in a lot of hostels, really beautiful hostels too. But anyway, I got stuck in this, you know, patch of manure. You know, the car just sunk down, and all I could do was get out. There was no one around. I couldn't see anyone, and I just got out. And I kept pushing the car. I tried to put it in gear and push it out. You know, put something on the gas, and I figured there's nothing. You know, it was wide open field. I'll just I'll run the car down before, if I get it out, just run, run, run jump in it, you know, leave the door open. And uh, I just, the wheels just kind of spun and I just got covered in cow crap. And then suddenly out of nowhere, this guy comes out in his tractor, you know, comes across, you know, off the horizon. There's a little speck of a man on a tractor coming towards me. And uh, he pulls me out of the mud, you know, drive back to the hotel and I just remember going through that hotel lobby just covered in cow crap. I'm like, yeah, hi. Yeah. I'm here. I'm just going to my room right now. You know? That was kind of funny. But uh, that was that was my first trip to, uh, to Northern Ireland. And uh, there's a lot of other stuff that kind of went on. And, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's better to keep it private uh, for, for people's people's, uh, people's, uh, people's, uh, protection, I don't know. most of the people weren't, weren't involved in anything, um, and, uh, it was a really great experience, you know, and just kind of learning the Irish, Irish culture, and, uh, you know, you had to go by a different name, I, I certainly had some fear going from one, because Sean is considered a Catholic Irish name. Uh, John is the Protestant name, so like going from one street to the other, uh, you know, you get the Falls Road, and then you get to, I can't think of the other name, but Falls is the Catholic Road, and the, uh, and the other street is a uh, Protestant. I remember all the murals pretty clearly, they were, they were pretty prominent there. I think I, I remember seeing a parade or two. Um, yeah, unfortunately, there was no like incidents while I was there, um, but, you know, I did get a sense that, that, that the people, that, uh, you know, some people had, had the same sort of quiet, and, and like, like I said, you know, like, because of you 2 in America, I think a lot of the people in Oregon had that same feeling as I did, you know, like, it's not really entertainment, you know. It, it's not really entertaining, you know. And like you just kind of want to be people, kind of, kind of get, be around people who get that, you know. Um, but you don't really want to continue with it, you know. At the same time, you know, you want to like keep perpetuating it. So you kind of hope being around people who, who understand it are more um, cautious, are more sort of. Uh, they're less frivolous about it, you know. It's a much more serious thing to them. I um, just want to talk a little bit about Belfast, USA, the, uh, the book that never got published. And it's kind of funny because, like, later I would go down to New York City, um, I think, like, two years later after I came back from the States, and I needed help, you know. I was like, I don't know what to do with all this material. I don't know how to put a book together, you know. So I was like, I need an editor or somebody. I need somebody to work with, you know. <laughs> 
So I went to Penguin Books down there in New York City, just this big building, skyscraper, and I just kind of went up to the receptionist, and I was like, I want to talk to an editor, can I talk to an editor? I got, like, I want, I got a book I'm trying to write, you know? <laughs> I need to talk to an editor. Like, do you know, have a name? I'm like, I don't have any names, it's just somebody I can talk to. <laughs> They're like, no, you have to, like, know somebody. You can't just walk in here and, like, expect to sit down with an editor. I'm like, well, I figured I'd try. <laughs> and so, uh, and so uh, that was kind of the, you know, that just kind of, I didn't pursue it that much after that. I, and I had promised them a movie, and that was one of the reasons when I went back to college in 1997, when I went to, back to SUNY Purchase, I kind of made a point to make my senior film, you know, attempt to make that film. film I call Picture Show. Picture Show. Anyway, that's, uh, and yeah, I, I actually got to put that on it. I can talk about that another time. I never got to, like, I finished the film, but I couldn't show it. That was how, how it worked out with that. Not because of any sort of political reasons. I couldn't show it because the college, college graduated me without a married print. Like, Mary Print is when your audio track and your picture track are one track, they're married together on a single track, and then you then you can project it on any 16 millimeter projector, you know, uh, most projectors have, you know, the magnetic strip for audio is right on the picture, and projectors, your conventional projector, um, you know, can, can read that, and you, you can get your movie, you know, but... Uh, graduated people with just kind of working prints. Working prints is you got your audio with all its splices on it, and you got your picture with all its splices on it. And you need a machine, usually an editing board, but they do have certain, you know, screening rooms and movie, you know, movie studios and things like that. When they want to see a working print or get an idea where the film is going, they do have these projectors that can, you can sync them, sync them up and project it. Otherwise, you have to work on your editing board. Alright, still April 26 here. I'm headed to work at Amazon now. But there's a couple other things I thought of that I left out uh, that I want to put it into on that journal uh, with this entry. So that year in purchase, that one year, 1987 to 88, that I went to college and then I dropped out to go to Ireland. Um, like I said, I was still having that problem. Uh, still had that fear of sexual initiation, you know, and there was a couple of things that kind of led me to Ireland. That one was a film called Cow by Pat O'Connor that came out in 90, 1984. It's about a young man who was involved in the Troubles and his sexual initiation. And I was kind of like, oh, that's you know, that's kind of what that's what I'm going through. So that's that kind of took me towards Ireland. But a couple other things, like I couldn't, still couldn't connect with any girls. Like at college, I had girlfriends after Sheila. There, my first girlfriend was a girl named Jessica. She was Jewish. No, it wasn't Jessica. It was a. Uh, I can't think of her name. It was a Jewish girl, and she wouldn't. She wouldn't. She would fool around with me, but she wouldn't be my girlfriend because I wasn't Jewish. So I was like, well, that's that's pretty much prejudice right there. But anyway. And then my next girlfriend was a girl named Linda. Linda. Was a uh, was related to Donovan, you know the folk singer Donovan, uh, and her cousin was Ioni Sky, and Linda took me to meet the Red Hot Chili Peppers before they were, you know, they were just had released their first album. And Hillel Slavic was still with the band, Slovic was still with the band, and uh, we got to go down to Webster Hall on Halloween, and you know, it was kind of a really cool night. And she had a friend. Because uh, Matt Dillon, I remember Matt Dillon being in line waiting to get in, and he was kind of pulling the "Don't you know who I am?" thing on the uh, the bouncer. And the bouncer was like, "I don't care who you are. <laughs> All that matters is who I am right now." And uh, so Matt Dillon got kind of stuck. And we met uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you know, it wasn't like, "Hey, what's going on?" I was just kind of scared. Basically, I was kind of shy about it. I was, I didn't really know who they were to begin with, <laughs> but they all seemed kind of drugged out, to be honest with you. And, uh, and I met Ioni Sky, who is, uh, I guess, is like Donovan's daughter or 
something like that. And uh, she went on, she was uh, in a movie called River's Edge. She, she went on to be an actress. Also that year in Purchase, uh, Parker Posey was uh, studying acting and I knew Parker Posey. We ran in the same circles, the acting, the acting classes and the filmmaking classes were very, obviously very sort of closely together because they were, had acted in our shorts. And Parker Posey was kind of in my circle of friends. I knew her and you know, I considered her somebody uh, who was, you know, had the potential to be in my films <laughs> in, in college. But I like to work very privately. But anyway, that was my second, Linda was my second girlfriend there. She had a girlfriend named Marina, a Russian girl. And I always remember Marina was like, you reminded, I reminded her of Steven Seagal for some reason. That's all I heard, Steven. She would call me like Steven Seagal. But what did she call me? Sergio. That's what she called me. She used to call me Sergio for some reason. And uh, and then my next girlfriend was a was a really pretty a blonde girl from Connecticut. Her name was Megan. And Megan Megan was probably the one that really kind of wanted to have sex, you know, because that was I guess kind of ballerinas had an appetite for it. And she really didn't have any time for me if I wasn't gonna. It was kind of do me or leave kind of deal and so we got really close to it once or twice and I wouldn't go through with it and she kind of then the next thing I know is I'm walking into her bedroom and there's a black guy in there right and you know I was furious because I thought we were still going out and uh, I remember like later that week or something like that there was a dance you know and I caught up with the black guy and I went up and punched him after that, it was like, you know, it was like people thought I was racist or something like that, you know. I had nothing to do with that. It was like you're sleeping with my girl when I was still going out with her. But, like, that's been a reoccurring theme for blonde girls, like, throughout my life, ever since that incident. Like, oh, I'm with a black guy now, you know, because you wouldn't consummate it back then. And, like, I kind of, like, don't really have a lot of patience for those tolerance just as much as they don't have much patience for me uh, you know it's like hard for me to have patience with them uh, you know even now that I'm sexually <laughs> initiated been so for a long time it's like they always kind of like all the blonde girls seem to like have this like oh we got a problem with a black guy and you're racist kind of deal anyway I just want to throw that in there some of those experiences out here that kind of let me over to Ireland Oh yeah, Helen Mirren is in 